What are the biggest pain points for Boston Dynamics as far as actually bringing these products to market? So first of all, let me set the record straight. We weren't trying to monetize sure. the robots all those years. Uh, in fact, we've always been a money-making organization, uh, even in the early years, although we weren't doing it by uh, building robot products. But we have been building robots for about the last dozen years, and it is true that we did uh, you know, contract work at first, and then we were, uh, you know, I'll call it self-funded by both Google and now SoftBank. Uh, and now we are adding a branch to the things we do. We've been an R&D company for a long time. We love being an R&D company. And now we're uh, adding being a product company in a couple of areas. Spot, uh, I would say Spot will be our first product. But as we're going to discuss, we did an acquisition recently who already has a robot product out there. Uh, but Spot will be the first uh, product developed at Boston Dynamics starting this summer. And you know maybe a year or two. A year and a half later, we'll have uh, Handle as a product as well. So you asked what the pain points are. Uh, you know, obviously the skill set required to making a product are have additional things in addition to uh, the engineering that you do to develop a new, the first one of anything. So for instance, we've been worrying about passing EMI certification tests, uh, safety uh, for the robot, uh, supply chain uh, and getting manufacturing all in hand and all of that stuff has been a learning curve. I wouldn't say it's been a pain point but uh, uh, you know we've certainly learned a lot, added some new styles of people to our to our team in order to do that. Okay so you alluded to Handle before so actually let's let's start with that video, let's play the Handle video and I, I want to say right off the bat I think this is the one thing that we're showing today that probably everybody in this audience has already seen but this will give you some uh, some context. Let's go back to that video we just as there we go. Okay, so uh, so this is Handle. This is a robot that we've seen in the past, but now it's actually doing a very specific job. Is this was this a robot built to be a logistics robot? It's the closest we have to a purpose-built robot. So when we started, we've been interested in making a wheeled legged combination for a long time, and never had quite the right sponsor for it, uh, but. About two years ago, we just decided we were going to do it, and we built the, the handle you've seen before, which was partly Atlas parts and partly new, which were the legs with the wheels. And once we got it going, we started being interested in the logistics opportunity, and we redesigned the whole thing with this particular task in mind. That is, moving boxes, stacking them in pallets, and destacking them from pallets. And there's just a huge amount of uh, this kind of work going on around the world. Uh, we estimate that there's about a trillion cubic foot boxes moved around the world every year. And uh, most of it's not automated, and so there's really a, a huge uh, opportunity there. And of course, this robot is great for us because it includes the DNA of a balancing robot and moving dynamically and having counterweights that let it reach a long way. So it's not different in some respects from the robots we've been building for years. On the other hand, some of it's very focused on grasping, being able to see boxes, and do tasks like stack them neatly together. So, I mean, so it's, it's, it very much is a Boston Dynamics robot from the standpoint of it is, it is quite complex in a lot of ways. I was out in, um, at an Amazon fulfillment center in Staten Island a couple months ago, and we saw the, the Kiva, now Amazon Robotics robots, and those are, at their base, they're very simple, and most of these factory automation fulfillment robots we're seeing are very simple. This is, this is a lot more complex, so I, how do you actually sell a company on such a, a complex, sophisticated robot? So, this robot's about half as complicated as our most complex robots, but you're absolutely right, it's much more complicated uh, than most of the things you find in warehouses. On the other hand, there's nothing that can do the functionality that this robot does, uh, you know, in, in terms of reaching across a deep pallet or reaching to the top of a tall pallet. Uh, there's no machine out there that can do it. And so we had this at Promat. We didn't have the robot. We had video of this robot at Promat, which is a logistics conference, uh, the week before last, I think. And there was intense interest in getting that functionality uh, available. Uh, we know that combating the complexity is going to be one of the things, you know, making it reliable enough is one of the things we're going to have to uh, work on. I don't think the cost is going to be a problem because uh, 
uh, you know, the cost isn't going to be that out of range, and uh, the functionality of the robot uh, is really offers a lot. And Boston Dynamics made really your first major acquisition recently in order to basically complete this robot. Can you talk about that? Sure. The robot, the vision system used in the video you just saw uh, is used to both locate the pallets using markers, but then when it gets to the pallet, it looks for boxes and looks for the shape of the box and finds the one it's supposed to pick up and picks it up. And it works pretty well, but we decided that we really needed to up our game, and so we acquired Kinema Systems, a company located in Menlo Park, who's got just an extraordinary uh, 3D uh, deep learning based vision system that we are actively working on porting uh, to handle. We're also going to sell the product they have, which is a fixed manipulator that's doing uh, depalletizing. And if you go on the web, you can see their, their videos. Uh, but we're also going to take that vision system and adapt it for use with handle. We're really excited by that. We're also going to adapt their vision system uh, wherever it fits with all of our robots because it's uh, really remarkable. They got an award, uh, I think, last year from NVIDIA for one of the best uh, uh, deep learning-based uh, applications out there. I think they were one of two top winners. And I was going to ask you about that. So obviously, a big part of the reason why you made the acquisition was specifically for this logistics. So you know, spotting boxes on the shelves, things like that. Um, again, the robot that we were talking about last year and that we'll be talking about in a bit is a Spot Mini, which is the first robot you announced will be commercialized. Does the Kinema technology make sense for a Spot Mini? I, I don't know exactly about Spot Mini. Uh, you know, Spot Mini is designed uh, as a platform where it's got a vision system built into it that's doing a good job, but then there's an opportunity to add stuff, which we're expecting third parties to add. And when we get the robot out here, I'll show you a little bit more about that. I don't think we need a Kinema system right now, but I'll tell you more broadly at our company, everybody's fighting over who's going to get first shot at uh, using Kinema's technology for their application. And we're, you know, we're trying to keep it focused on the immediate need, which is handle, but uh, everybody's lining up to uh, both take care, take advantage of their knowledge and of the capability of the system. Okay, so let's get to our next video. It's just something you showed me backstage, which is absolutely amazing. It's a behind the scenes look that um, I've never seen before and I think most of the folks haven't seen before. So these are the components of Spot Mini that we're seeing being tested in the laboratory. So obviously we care about making Spot Mini reliable and have long life when it's out there. So we've been doing a variety of testing in our lab where this is the component testing where we, those obviously are the legs. Uh, we uh, have uh, the arm, which I think you'll see next. We have the shoulder uh, and hip motors and uh, all those actuators. Here's some other internal uh, drives all being life tested uh, in our place. But we're also testing the whole assembled robots. So we have this thing that sort of looks like a corral uh, and there's automation software, which is the software it uses to navigate uh, and it's just on an endless uh, testing run. On the right there, there's an obstacle, so the robot sees the obstacle and avoids it. Uh, here we have two different floor types, so the robot's dealing with that. I don't know what's happening in this lane, maybe just life testing. And there's a stairway in number four. And basically we run about uh, 200 kilometers of travel a week. Currently we get bug reports and the, the software people and the hardware people are working on resolving those bugs. Uh, this is uh, another lane of testing where we have both uh, inclines and you can see there's a little uh, rocky area there. All these different things require different skills on the part of the robot. So uh, can you actually talk about um, some, some of the applications that the company has been looking at? Again, this is a very different model from the standpoint of Handle being a relatively purpose-built robot, as you said. And this seems to be a case wherein now that you're starting to bring it to market, um, you're figuring out some of these applications as you go along in a way. So let me preface that by saying we think of our three robots. Uh, there's Atlas, which is an R&D robot, and we have no plans to commercialize it anytime soon. Then there's Spot, which we think of as a general purpose robot, which means we don't have in mind the specific application that's going to just knock things out of the park, but it's got a lot of versatility and we've designed it to have versatility so people can customize it. And then there's Handle, which is a purpose-built robot and it's going to do really just one or two things and we're optimizing it for that. But going back to Spot, Spot is a platform 
where you can add mechanical components and uh, there's an API so you can add your own software. And in fact, we've been developing components uh, in order to get the uh, project out of the gate where we've added a manipulator, which is an add-on. We've added a 3D, a 360-degree set of cameras that also has a very low-light camera, which you'll see. Why don't you go to the next video and I can Yeah, let's, I actually, can talk let's actually go to the next video right now so we can actually see it. There we go. See it in uh, action. So what, what is it doing? What's the purpose right so here? So this is being tested at the Massachusetts State Police, and this is one of their testing places where they worry about hostage situations or bomb scares. And the idea is to avoid having to have a person go through that door to see what's going on. So, you know, so there's somebody inside, the door opens up, and boom, there's a robot opening that door. Right. And the idea is that the robot can open up the door. There is someone teleoperating it uh, from, uh, from a safe location. We have been experimenting with teleoperating over longer and longer distances, and we've done it from California to Boston. I recently did it from an airplane flying over Chicago. Uh, to wherever the data first goes, on to Boston. On the Wi-Fi on the plane. On the Wi-Fi on the plane. You all know how terrible a communication that is. But the key technology is having enough autonomy on the robot so that some simple high-level input from the user can, uh, can be an effective solution. Uh, and that's what uh, we tested there. Why don't you go to the next yeah, one? Yeah, let's, let's play the final video. And, and I, I want to ask you real quick again. Uh, last year when we were on stage, you mentioned um, a time frame. I think of this summer. We're aiming for July or August. These will start. So we're, we have these things coming off an assembly line now, but they're all betas. And we're using them for testing like you just saw. And we're also uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, redesign. And then the production will really start in July. Here's at a construction site in Tokyo where the robot has previously been taken through the space and we've mapped it. And here the robot is autonomously going on a route, collecting data. You see it's got that tall thing on its butt. That's a set of 360 cameras that takes very high resolution imagery. We have software that lets you treat the imagery pretty much like Street View, except it's Street View for these cases. And this lets the construction company get an assessment of progress at their site. You might think that that's a, a low-end task, but these companies have thousands of sites, and they have to patrol them at least a couple of times a week to know where they are in progress, and uh, they're uh, anticipating using Spot uh, for that. So we have over a dozen construction companies uh, lined up to uh, do tests at various stages of uh, testing and proof of concept uh, in their uh, scenarios. This is a, not a skyscraper. This is more of a hotel where the spaces are tighter, and so the navigation has uh, additional demands on it uh, as compared to the other one. So uh, we're a couple months out from, from July at this point. Are you able to talk about pricing yet? Not quite yet, okay. this summer. OK, so we do have a very special guest. Um, can we actually bring him out on stage? This is uh, Lily Cohn. And, uh, Beta, what number is it? Uh, 24, I can't quite see. 26. So if you could actually start by walking through, this is um, close to production unit. If you can start by walking through what's new about this spot mini. You know, we've, we've redesigned many of the components to make it more reliable, uh, to make the skins work better, and to protect it if it uh, does fall. This robot has, uh, I'm going to go out there and point at a few things. This has cameras. It has two sets on the front, uh, and one on each side, and one on the back, so it can see in all directions. I, I got to say, too, it looks a little more banged up, I think, than I've seen a lot of your robots. It looks like it's kind of been through the ringer we, a bit. I mean, we've been testing these things relentlessly. As I say, they usually go through many hours of, of testing a week. They do fall still. This is also designed, you, these are like roof racks so that when you build your special platform, like maybe the previous speakers will make a, uh, a deck that you can take a drone off from, and they'll just attach that. There's connections for, um, for an Ethernet so that they can communicate, and then we have our IP API. This also has a special radio on it. It has built-in Wi-Fi, but for an event like this where you all have your phones out and you're texting and stuff, Wi-Fi can be uh, unreliable, so we're using a a spread spectrum uh, radio, and of course it's got the arm. Why don't we show off the arm? One of the great things about a mobile robot like this with an arm is that the workspace is essentially infinite, and the motion of the base contributes to the motion of the arm. If you have a fixed arm, 
they're <laughs> usually very limited to what they can do. And of course, we've coordinated the arm with the body, so Lily is actually just driving the hand. I know you think it's a head, but it's really a hand. And she can drive it fore and aft and sideways, and now she's put it into a mode where the hand is stabilized in space. We love to call it, I love to call this chicken head mode. And really, people have the capability of stabilizing their manipulators and their heads while the rest of it moves. And it really facilitates the ability to handle objects and work in the world as the robot travels around in the world. Can, can you talk a little bit about the control mechanism? Um, so this has onboard computers that are interpreting the data from the vision. They also interpret data from the, the load cells in the, uh, in the link so it can feel the environment. It's balancing itself. I won't kick it. We're not allowed to do that anymore. But I'll show that it's stable. And if I push on it, if I push hard enough, it'll step. And uh, it, you know, it's pretty robust. If it does fall over, it can get back up. Um, so there's the low-level stabilization of the robot. And then it has um, vision that it can use to negotiate obstacles, like this block. And uh, here, Lily, I want you to run me down with the robot. It won't do it, huh? I wouldn't promise that it's never going to run into anybody, but uh, it's using its vision uh, to treat me as an obstacle, and then even though Lily's just saying go straight ahead, it goes around. And later on, we're, I think after the show closes, we're going to demo this out front, and you can drive it, and uh, see, you, know, you can see if you can run one of us down with it if you want. Um, and then on top of that, we have navigation software that can autonomously navigate around space, and eventually you guys will all be writing apps that run in, uh, and interact with uh, the controls on the robot. So wh what's, the, what's the purpose then of having it manually controlled? Because it, it seems like the vast majority of the time it's going to be moving around autonomously. I, th I don't know. There's many people who have applications. So there's the police application where they really want to drive it, although, again, the autonomy is always running at a low level. Uh, we have people who want to do gas and oil applications where you're out in an oil rig or something like that. And they're happy to have a person in the loop. They just don't want to have the person out on the uh, oil rig. And uh, we, other energy applications where uh, it doesn't really need to be completely autonomous in the fact that there's no one there. And then we have lots of applications where autonomy is the thing. And I think the kinds of paradigms used, I hope, will unfold as we get uh, the world building on top of uh, this. We want it to be like the Android. Uh, of, uh, of robots where people are developing their own apps. And the Android of Androids? The Android of Androids, yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, we're running out of time right now, but I, I guess a really a good question to close on is, um, what, what do the next few months look like for Spot Mini? You know, what's the road to production? So we've, uh, we've, we're in a feature freeze in the software. That happened, I think, two weeks ago. So this is, this is pretty close to... I don't know if this is the, uh, if the frozen software. This is probably a previously frozen demo. Uh, release, but it's, it's very much like this, and we're just you know running down bugs, making sure that we comply with what the uh, targets were. So you know things are f getting more and more narrowed down in our process. You know our company is is most you know our history as an R and D company has things much more freewheeling. So it's a new process to have uh, a feature freeze and then have uh, this thing gradually go. We're we're working on certification. We just passed EMI certification. Uh, Safety, you know, safety is a moving target because uh, the simple things you can do with safety are, is just turn something off. But if you have a robot on a stairway and something's going wrong, you don't necessarily just want to turn it off and have it tumble down, which can cause other problems. So we're working with the, uh, the standards people to try and come up with rules that make sense in the context of uh, robots like this. Great. Unfortunately, as I said, we had a lot to talk about, and we are actually all out of time. But as Mark mentioned earlier, the robot, uh, you're going to be sticking around for a while. And after the panelists are over, you can actually check out Spot Mini in person up in the front. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm here, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we can leave together. Okay. Uh, coming up next, we have uh, another fireside chat with uh, Anthony Lewandowski of Pronto AI and your moderator, Kirsten Korosek. Mark, thank you so much. Okay, thank you.